There we go. All right, nice. Good. Well, thank you very much. First of all, thanks to Young Americans for Liberty for inviting me and putting this on. By the way, am I too loud? Is that, so is that driving everyone insane? No? It's good. All right. Okay, good. All right, that's good. Uh, I appreciate this. Glad to have the invitation. I, uh, because of a university regulation, I can't sell any books here. Even though I did bring them, I cannot sell them to you. So instead of that, if you want to just, you know, come give me some money, you could do that. <laughs> might be a little socially awkward, but, but I can certainly have it better than said. Uh, thanks to all of you for, for coming here tonight. I mean, it's a bit out of the way. It's always hard to find these university rooms. And also, it's just some godforsaken temperature out there. Although, I guess for you guys, this is bomb. But for me, I just can't. I just lived uh, four years in the South after having lived all, all my life in uh, the Northeast. So I got used to the, the winters. And, being so mild, and I guess it's not that way everywhere. So, uh, now, now we now live in Kansas, by the way, and it, nobody told me it snowed so much, it was so cold, I, oh. now we find out after we already bought the house, houses are totally illiquid in this market, so now we're, now we're pretty much stuck. I have to, um, what in the world did I bring here? Oh yeah, I, I have to always be careful to, to ration my travel. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I could be on the road constantly because I, I just enjoy doing it. But I had to just decide, well, this thing I'll do and this thing I just will have to pass up and, and I wish I could do it. Uh, partly because I'm not a bachelor anymore and haven't been for quite some time and I've got four little kids at home. And so, for example, coming up to this event, I think it's originally proposed that we do it January 25th. But that's when our youngest daughter was turning one and I've always pledged I'm not going to be away for the birthdays. So I was there for the birthday, I was there for the ceremonial destruction of the first piece of cake all over the kid's face. I was there for that. I saw that. Well, I have the other three children I have are also girls. So I do indeed have four girls. And the seven and a half year old, who is our oldest, yeah, that's right, they're all young. Four young girls. But thankfully, my wife has raised them, and maybe I had some role in it, but She's the saint in the family, has raised it to be so pleasant and wonderful. Like, I didn't realize that a seven and a half year old could be as pleasant and interesting and nice as this one. I just thought, you know, kids scream all the time. I, I knew nothing about them. I was an only child. What can I say? But my seven and a half year old is so aware of things. I'm constantly amazed at this. And I guess, you know, now that I have a conversation with my wife around a seven and a half year old whom I know is listening in and can understand what we're saying, I probably have to watch some of the things I say a little more carefully. But, but I, I, I've told this story a few times because I'm just shocked at it. Not that long ago, she was having a, a chat with another seven year old about some story involving Penny Hanny. And the other little girl she was talking to said to my daughter, well, this uh, story about Penny Candy seems kind of silly to me because, you know, pennies don't buy anything anymore. And my daughter said, I am not joking, my daughter said, yeah, thanks to the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, and this is just because she's watching TV. This is just because she apparently has seen some TV too much. I do not put her up to this. Because as somebody who puts forward some of the views I do, I am super careful to pay every dime I owe the IRS. I got every everything filed properly. It, bring it on, baby, because I got every receipt, I got every every one carried, and everything else. But I was saying to my daughter, it was always sad when I had to leave, and I come back and say, but you know, I mean, I I sold some books, and I well, I won't be able to tell her that this time. But you know, I'll be able to say, you know, we, we did okay, you know, we'll be able to keep the lights on and everything. And, and in fact, at one time I was actually opening the check and saying, see, so I mean, it's not like I'm just leaving for no reason. And she, she said, uh, better not tell the IRS about that check. I'm like, how cool are you? <laughs> anyway, I, 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 she's a sweet, wonderful girl, but my gosh, I said, well, don't ever say that around anybody. I don't want the goons knocking on our door, for heaven's sake. All right, well, what I'm going to talk about tonight is kind of, a, it's a, kind of an oddball topic. But I have, a, I have a new book coming out on February 7th. Uh, and and some, anybody who has kind of any, uh, at all followed my activities over the past, let's say, two years, 
might seem a little odd, like how could, why would I have another book coming out in February? I just had one come out in June. And it just, it's a long story. I was working on this one first, and just the timing was weird, and so on. And so oddly enough, I had another book coming out. And I hate the title, and I hate the subtitle. I'll, I'll just tell you the title, which I think it's called Rollback. And you say, well, why didn't you come up with another title? Now, the publisher, they dug in their heels on this one. They said, the bookstores like this. It sends a message. It's about basically what is going to need to be done, given that there is a massive fiscal tsunami coming. At some point, it's going to become obvious that the government cannot keep its promises in a whole bunch of areas. And so we're going to have to make hard decisions. It will be absolutely unavoidable. It will be impossible to kick the can any longer. And so the book is going to examine that. Uh, that's that's a, at least a, a portion of what the, the book is about. And so having said that, that, this fact, and I, and I hope that by the end of, of tonight, when I get to the last portion of my talk, I will be able to persuade you that this is an inevitability, that there are going to be wrenching changes in our lifetimes. Uh, I mean, within this coming generation, I think I, I, I think I should be able to persuade you of this. Given that this is unavoidable, I'm suggesting that this is an opportune moment for us now to go back and re-examine some of the myths that we may have thoughtlessly accepted, some of the bill of goods that we've been sold over the years about government and about its accomplishments and about how allegedly lost we'd be without it. If it weren't for them, everybody would be working 100 hours a week in a mine, getting his hands blown off for two cents a day. Like, I mean, like, we, this is what we all got in the fifth grade history text. Like, I, I understand why people believe these things. I'm not saying that it's silly to believe it. It's what we're all told. But it's precisely these kind of myths that have allowed the government to win the benefit of the doubt from the general public. The general public thinks, well, you know, sure, they make mistakes once in a while. Well, sure, you know, occasional mistake. But they have my interests at heart. They're, they're decent people. They just want to help us. That's all they do. They're selfless public servants with a thirst for justice. And I'm kind of suggesting that this is really unworthy of a second grade, this kind of analysis of, of government. And so part of what my book is about is not just spelling out the fiscal crisis, but also going back and taking this as an opportune moment to re-examine what we thought we knew about government and its accomplishments. Because it is precisely these sorts of myths that have, in effect, allowed the government to get away with much of what it's done because people have bought into this entire edifice of belief regarding its, its good intentions and how indispensable it is. And we'd be at the mercy of, of uh, feudal barons and so on and on without I, I want to dispute some of this. Um, now, uh, what I could do tonight is cover a whole bunch of these sort of myths really badly, or I could cover a few of them somewhat less badly, and that's the strategy that I'm adopting. So what I'm choosing out of these topics that I've covered are ones that I think are most directly relevant to us at this particular moment. Uh, there's much more that I, I talk about in the book. Uh, there's a whole chapter on uh, the military budget, where a lot of conservatives have sort of given the Pentagon a free pass, you know, kind of implicitly suggesting, what are you some kind of comedy if you want to cut the military budget? I mean, don't you know, if it weren't for the military budget, we'd all be speaking Arabic and all this stuff. And what I'm showing in there is, among other things, that since 9-11, there's been an increase over and above the, the normal trend. There's been a $2 trillion increase in outlays for the Pentagon. And half of that has gone to wars. And the other half, where did it indeed go? It turns out that when you look at uh, military acquisition and the increase in the various uh, sectors of the, of the armed forces, you, you, what you find is that the number of, of naval ships has gone down dramatically. The number of planes in the Air Force has gone down dramatically. The, the Army has increased marginally, but at a time when its budget increased by more than 50%. So it's one of the great swindles in the history of the Republic, and it's not even being reported. So you spend an extra trillion bucks and you get less. You get less for it. And this is the one department that is not subject to audit. There is no audit of the Department of Defense. It's not like they can't pass an audit. It's not like people look at the books and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you blew this money on this stuff. They can't track the money in the first place to find out how bad it's being spent. So we don't know if defense contractors, uh, military contractors, are they being paid once? Are they being paid not at all? Are they being paid twice? Nobody knows the answer. 
I could talk about that, but I'm going to leave that out. And that's very, very interesting. Uh, that will be chapter, I don't know. I don't even know what chapter it is. Let's just say five, arbitrarily. I think it's chapter five of rollback. But instead, I want to focus on slightly dorkier topics because it's more challenging. Like everybody's interested in the military, right? It's very interesting. Yeah, I want to get you interested in much dorkier stuff than this. Walking out tonight thinking, man, if I don't learn more about this dorky stuff, my life has no meaning at all. Now let's see if let's see if I can get you to quite that level. So the first thing I want to talk about is some of you say, oh man, you're talking about this again. Good grief, I watched all your freaking YouTubes because you never shot about this. Well, all right, that's true. I do have a fixation on business cycles. That is true. But that's because, you know, we're living in one. And we're, they're threatening to put us through another one. So we have, to, we have to commit this knowledge to memory. We've got to get this, this down. And in particular, this is going to be my jumping off point for saying something about the Great Depression, which, as you heard, is part of my topic. That'll be part of the mythology that I want to address. But first, we're just digging into just the very basics of this. Business cycles, what do you mean by business cycles? How come the economy seems to move in this sort of up and down pattern, like everybody's doing great, you know, we're all thrilled with each other, and then everybody's doing badly, we're all in the toilet, nobody quite gets why, and then we're doing well again, and then bad, then how come, why is that? Why does it seem to go like this? And there have been a variety of answers given. Uh, one is that these are just the contradictions of capitalism working themselves out, uh, the sort of Marxian solution. Uh, another is that this is a psychological thing, that investors are moved by so-called animal spirits, and their optimism or pessimism is what tends to drive the cycle. Uh, yet another answer is we have absolutely no freaking idea what causes these cycles. And, and that's not even necessary. I'm not even trying to make fun of this, but it's that people just throw up their hands and said, well, every business cycle is so unique that we just can't figure out what the common denominator is. So it's just one of these things that you just gotta live with. You've got to take the good and the bad. Okay, but some of us are a little more impatient. I don't want to take the good with the bad. I just want the good, man. I want to get rid of the bad. Can we pinpoint a source of the bad? Where is this bad coming from? How, or how come maybe could we just go like this? Wouldn't that be great? Just everything onward and upward into the light would be great. Why does it have to keep going down? Like what, what is going on here? And so this is where people like this guy come to the rescue. Now you're going to say to yourself, you've got to, you've got to tie with a guy's head. All over. This is getting a little bit odd, uh, perhaps slightly cultish even. But, 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 it's an economist on my tie. I know that actually makes it worse, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Murray Rothbard, who died in 1995. In fact, uh, just 16 years ago this month, as a matter of fact. And Rothbard was one of the great economists of the Austrian School of Economics. Now, when you talk about the Austrian School of Economics, I've talked about this in many venues, people immediately think, well, Austria is a small country. What does that have to do with our economy today? The Austrian School of Economics has nothing whatsoever to do with the country of Austria. In fact, if you walked down the streets of Vienna and you started talking about the Austrian School, they would not know what God's green earth you were talking about. All it has to do with Austria is that some of the original economists from this school of thought hailed from the and it's this school of thought, which is the smallest existing school of thought in economics today. It's also the longest lived such schools, the oldest one still in existence. But it's also the fastest growing, because when we had this collapse uh, a few years ago, it caught almost everybody by surprise. James Galbraith, son of John Kenneth, said in the New York Times, and yeah, I would say maybe a dozen economists out of the tens of thousands of professional economists, maybe a dozen saw this coming, and that's pretty darn low. That is a low percentage. You could round that up to zero. Those economists were probably even drunk, so you probably all of them failed to see this. But, 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 disproportionately, way out of proportion to their numbers, the Austrian school economists had been warning of this and pinpointing what was going to happen pretty much to a T, and then it happened, and then suddenly people were interested. How do these people know? How did these people know what was going to happen? Are they using tea leaves? And they got a crystal ball? Are they using tarot cards? And then they flipped over and then it was the death card. And they said, aha. Things are like, how did they know? And then you've got guys on TV now 
who represented the Austrian position, which we didn't have before, people like Peter Schiff. The great thing about Peter Schiff is that he's so aggressive, like they try to shut him up. The only way to shut him up is shut off his microphone. And he just keeps on talking. You try to interrupt him, he doesn't even hear you. In fact, he, even when he's done talking, he's immediately thinking to himself, okay, what are the next points I can make? He's so aggressive, he's a bulldog to get these points out there. And when he was arguing this stuff in 2006 and early 2007, saying Fannie and Freddie are going bust, the housing market is coming down, all these various things, he was, and this is not a joke, he was actually laughed at, literally, he was laughed at on, on TV. You can see all this in the great Peter Schiff was right video where they, on, on YouTube, where they compile all these little clips from his appearances on the various cable news channels. And sure enough, the guy turns out to be vindicated. One of the economists he debated with a guy named Arthur Laffer. Arthur Laffer said, oh, come on, Peter, you know, you're such a doomsayer. Everything's fine. Nothing's going to do. We're not going to have a big downturn. We're going to have a mild little blip. That's all we're going to have. And so they, they had a gentleman sort of bet. They, they bet one penny on this, that, uh, that there would or would not be the kind of downturn that Schiff was described. So then it actually happens. Can you believe Laffer won't pay the penny? <laughs> I mean, it's like the worst cheap scam you've ever heard in the history of mankind, like one stinking penny. And he says, well, nobody can predict the economy six months out. Well, well then why are you saying, why are you assuring the country nothing's going to happen? We should have just said, I don't know anything. How could I? No one can predict six months out. Well, no one can predict six months out when you find out that you were dead wrong. Then suddenly, so some of the people want to know, well, how did he know? So thanks to the internet, people can just type in Austrian economics and find out about it. Whereas no, before the internet, if you were to look up Austrian economics, where would you even start? Right? There'd be nobody in the media that would know anything about it. You wouldn't see it on TV. You wouldn't hear it represented anywhere. You wouldn't be able to find any literature on it. Now you just type it in. You get like 50 zillion Google hits. You got the whole Ludwig von Mises Institute, where you can sit there for the rest of your life if all you want to do is read economics and listen to lectures, this is the site for you. If you've decided you just hate mankind and all you want to do is just sit there and look at your computer screen, this is the site for you. And it's all for free. MISES.org. It's unbelievable what you can put on your iPod. And then suddenly you feel like, oh my gosh, I, I, I've suddenly got like a gigantic brain. It's incredible just for listening to this. And boy, this is the way to make friends, by the way, is to walk around like some big know-it-all jerk after hearing three podcasts. People love that. <laughs> you know, treat them with contempt because you've been listening to the Mises Institute podcast. Well, in particular now, we now have on YouTube a freaking rap video about F.A. Hayek, an Austrian economist who won the Nobel Prize in 1974, and his antagonist, John Maynard Keynes. And, and so you said in Hayek, H-A-Y-E-K, Hayek, Keynes, rap, Keynes, K-E-Y-N-E-S, and it comes up, and when you consider all the languages it's been translated into, it's like a couple of million people have watched these two actors pretending to be these economists rapping about what really causes the economy to go up and down. Now, we've never had this sort of discussion before. It's very, very rare, if it has happened at all, that we get the fundamental question. Usually what happens is the economy turns down, and then people say, well, you know, for whatever reason the economy turned down, now let's pump it up full of drugs and whatever stimulus stuff, and, you know, get, a, get this zombie thing going. You know, we, I, I know the economy is a zombie, but if I just inject it with some whatever, then the zombie will, you know, that's kind of usually, you, you, you don't actually get the question, well, what caused this? Where did it come from? What is the fundamental cause of this? So what the Austrian school has contributed to this discussion is that it actually does have a theory of why this keeps happening. And it's not a mystery. It's not like every single one is completely different. They all have their individuating characteristics, but they have something in common that I'm going to try to suggest to you. So i got to keep an eye on this, because I have got to stick to the time. It doesn't really matter. Oh, there is a clock, and I'm too blind to see it. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I kind of want to keep my glasses on when I talk. OK, so the Austrian theory of the business cycle. OK, this is, it's, it's just a breeze to understand this. And you say, my gosh, how could it be so simple? It's not quite so simple. But this is the basic, the basic overview. And it helps to account for how people knew something was rotten. Here. In fact, one shorthand way to know something is rotten is any time you hear, we have entered a new era in which there will never again be an economic downturn. Then you know what is coming. 
as like just absolute ironclad. They said that in the 1920s. We're in a new era of permanent prosperity. That was being said up through September 1929, that was being said. In the 1990s, during the internet boom, people are buying stocks in companies that make no sense, that have no customers, no profits, no product. People are gonna sell you like uh, pet food or whatever, like pets through the mail or whatever. People think yeah, this is the next big thing. And we heard again, this is a new economy. Alan Greenspan said, you know, maybe booms don't have to be followed by busts anymore in this new economy that we've got. And then in the, with the housing thing we had, this was supposed to be, nothing wrong with this housing boom that we were experiencing. This is based on real fundamentals. Yeah, it makes perfect sense that in San Francisco you get, you know, 300 square feet and it costs you 900 grand. That, that makes perfect sense. Why would you even question that? And, and all during the housing boom, we're all watching crazy lunatic TV shows. We don't even realize how lunatic they are. We're all caught up in this. Like uh, House Hunters on HGTV. I, I love that show. But if you watch the ones from the middle of the housing boom, people are going around saying, well, you know, we got 800 grand to throw around. And, you know, this house, what, it's only 7,000 square feet. Where's the gazebo? They're asking. Like, what, what's going on? And so people are off on this sort of crazy, crazy thing, but there's this sense that nothing's ever going to, this is, this is just, we've gone beyond. We've got scientific advancement of the economy now. We've got this under control. That's always a bad sign. Well, basically, it, it runs like this. It runs like this. There, there are just two things we need to know to understand this this Austrian theory, then we can apply it to what's happened today, which I'm not going to spend much time on tonight, because I wrote meltdown about that, but I'm going to apply it to the Great Depression. Uh, the, two th the one thing is uh, what, the, what the Austrians call the structure of production. Don't leave, don't, don't, don't think this is going to be bad, this is great. Structure of production is like the most glorious economic concept in the world. Basically it argues as follows, that when you go to the store and you buy uh, you know, a stick of butter or a hat, I, I, I always use hats. I don't even want to say hat. Hat comes up. A baseball bat, whatever it is that you're buying, a typical consumer good, it does not fall out of the sky ready made as a baseball bat. It's not like all of a sudden there was a bolt of lightning and a bat shaped thing fell out of a tree. There's a process that it goes through before it gets there. That's what we mean by the structure of production. There are different stages that goods, goods go through. We have high, high order stages and low order stages. The high order stages are the stages that are the most remote from the finished good. So let's say, uh, if it is a baseball bat, the high order stage would be me planting a, a tree. Now that tree, it's gonna take forever for that tree to grow, and then I gotta chop it down, and then I have to come up with equipment that I would need, which is also time consuming for me to actually make it into a baseball bat. So that's a very high order stage of production. So things like raw material extraction, research and development, research and development is very far from a finished consumer. Like we don't, we consumers, we don't directly consume research and development services. We, we consume the goods that research and development give rise to. So that's sort of the manufacturing, uh, uh, construction, all these things are relatively high order goods. And then you go down to, to still lower and lower stages where you get to various manufacturing processes that have various stages. Uh, then there's a, there's a wholesaler who gets the product and there's a marketing stage to alert people to the existence of the product, then you're going to get it to the retail outlet, and then when it's sitting there on the shelf and the consumer grabs it, that's the lowest of the stages. So that's what the authors are arguing. That's how production takes place. It's a time-consuming, stage-by-stage process. Now, this is, not, this is obviously not like some kind of crazy leap that they're making. This is not some crazy assumption. This does indeed sound like how things are created. That's the first thing. The second thing, it's just simply it's just simply uh, interest rates. Uh, what, what, is, what, is, what are interest rates? I mean, you go to the bank and you got to borrow money from them. The interest rate is how much on top of the principal that you borrow that you've got to pay to them at the end. Well, what determines what the interest rate is? How come it's three percent sometimes, and seven point eight percent another time, and, and whatever? And for our purposes, the, the basic answer is that if you have a genuine free market, you have, you have just you have no government involvement whatsoever. It's a free market. Interest rates fall when the public saves more. That's what makes interest rates fall. Why does that make interest rates fall? Because when the public saves more, they put more in the bank, the banks now have more to lend. So borrowing becomes cheaper because there's more, there are more loanable funds for them to lend. It's like just supply and demand. They get a greater supply of stuff to lend, so it's cheaper to borrow. 
In the same way, there's a greater supply of water, the price of water is going to be cheaper. And so businesses are going to want to in invest in a lot of their projects when interest rates are low. A lot, of, a lot of projects are funded by borrowing. And obviously, businesses would rather pay a lower interest rate than a higher rate. That's all we need to know. With those facts in mind, now we attack this. Now we attack this question. The question is, why is there in the economy this cyclical pattern where all of a sudden all these entrepreneurs who have been doing really well, all of a sudden they all seem to, or not all literally, but a whole bunch of them seem to be making losses simultaneously. Why are these business leaders all making errors sort of in a cluster? Why is that, why is it spread out more? Well, you know, why aren't, there, why aren't there some going out of business here, some here, some here, so that on net it's kind of like this. Some go out of business, so some go in business, it's like this. How come so many are tanking at once? What, what, what's getting to the, the, the uh, root of this? That's Hayek's question. That's the question that Hayek wins the Nobel Prize for answering. And uh, some of you may be skeptical of this, and you may say, well, I think there are some bozos who have won the Nobel Prize in economics. Why should I care if this guy won it? Well, the significant thing is that Hayek wins it for saying the opposite of what the Nobel Committee wants to hear. And so that, that I think, does, does make it significant. So basically, here's the answer to our question. We think about two scenarios. Scenario number one is the normal, natural scenario in which the public starts saving more. You and I start saving more. Interest rates come down. The businesses say, well, you know, we had wanted to build that additional plant. Or we had wanted to expand our mining capacity, but you know, 11 percent borrowing, you know, that's just terrible. We couldn't even consider it. But now that interest rates have fallen, well, now we'll think about doing it. They're like interest rates are 4 percent, now we'll do it. So that in other words, when the public saves more and brings interest rates down, this stimulates particularly long-term investment by business. And the longer term the investment is, the more it's stimulated, because the longer you have to borrow, the more the pain of the interest really gets to you. Like the longer you borrow for a house, the worse it is. Like every month you're making that mortgage payment and you say, I can't believe I'm making a $2,000 mortgage payment and like $200 is going to principal and $1,800 is, is interest. That's what happens when you have a third, when you're borrowing for 30 years. So the longer you're going to be borrowing, the more you're going to feel the effects of the interest rates coming down. And so that's going to artificially stimulate, it's going to stimulate the longer term type investment. All right, so this is fun. So step one is we save more, brings interest rates down, people begin, uh, businessmen begin engaging in long-term projects. Fine. Well, this is actually a good, sustainable outcome. Because when you and I save more, when we put more in the bank, we are doing two things implicitly. Uh, one is we are announcing that we are not going to blow all of our paychecks immediately. We are not going to blow every single penny immediately. Instead, we are going to defer some of our purchases for the future. That's why we're saving. We're saving up for something. Well, what are businesses doing while we do that? Well, they're engaging in increasing our productive capacity for the future. They're doing long-term investment. So we're saving for the future. They're getting ready to produce more in the future. So there's a time uh, coordination that takes place. But secondly, what happens when you and I save more? It means we're not buying as many iPods or you know, chicken dinners or well, whatever. We're not buying as many of those things anymore. So the makers of those things don't need to make as many anymore if we're not buying them. So those sectors of the economy, the lower order stages that, that sell us the finished consumer goods, tend to contract. We're not buying as much stuff. We're saving instead. And so they, they don't need as many uh, trucks to ship fewer goods. Uh, they don't need to use as much lumber, as many inputs. They don't need as many workers. So these things are going to shrink and release trucks and lumber and raw materials for use precisely by these businessmen that are engaged in long-term production. So in other words, we get all this brand new investment that takes place. Where are the resources coming from to make this physically possible? Because one end of the economy, the lower order state, is contracting, and that contraction releases the resources for the higher order stages, the longer term production to take place. So there's again a coordination. The second scenario is the, is the unsustainable. Now, let's say we've got some sinister institution that, that I, I won't mention the name of it, so we'll just, just I don't want to prejudice you. So we'll just say there's just some nameless entity that interferes in this process by pushing interest rates down artificially, just forces them down. So this time interest rates are falling, but not because you and I are saving more, just because they're being pushed down artificially. Now notice what the difference is. 
In this case, too, businesses see low interest rates and they think, okay, now's the time to engage in long-term production. But here's the difference. Number one, if we're not saving uh, anymore, uh, what does that mean? We're not spending any less on consumer goods. Consumer goods industries are not contracting. They're not releasing resources for the higher order stages to use in their production processes. So in effect, the economy is becoming too ambitious. We're biting off more than we can chew without realizing. We're continuing to consume at, at the same level or even an increased level. And yet at the same time, this other part of the economy, the higher order stages, the long-term investment, is also expanding at once. So we're, we're getting more investment and more consumption simultaneously. Well, unless resources for this are coming from Mars, this can't be sustained. There isn't enough physical stuff in the economy to satisfy all these projects, to complete all of them. And moreover, there's also a time mismatch because we haven't, we haven't lowered our consumption. And meanwhile, businesses are engaged in long-term product development of new products at the very time that we want more of existing products. So it leads to a discoordination. There are fewer resources in the economy than economic actors thought there were. And so ultimately, they're trying to do something that can't be done. They become overambitious. The best way to see this is uh, Louis van Mises' great analogy uh, that he, he uses in his great treatise, Human Action. He says, if you have trouble understanding the Austrian business cycle theory, imagine it like this. Imagine, it, imagine an economy with one guy. One guy, and he's doing one thing. He's building a house. Let's say we got a guy, and he's building a house. He's got his blueprint for the house, but this blueprint requires 20% more bricks than he actually has. Okay, well, he's going ahead and building. He doesn't realize he doesn't have enough bricks. And just by hypothesis, there are no other bricks. This is a whole economy. It's him and these bricks that he has. So obviously, he's doing something unsustainable. Like eventually, he's going to realize, I can't finish this house. So the sooner he realizes it, the better. Because then he can say, OK, wait a minute. All right, I, I, was, I was laying three rows of bricks, and then I looked back at my plans and my supplies. I was I can't build this house. So I'm going to have to adjust the blueprint and you know, tweak a few things and then rebuild with this in mind. But what if he notices his problem when he's putting the last brick on it and he turns his head? There, there are none left. Well, now he's wasted all this time and all these resources. It was a bad move on his part. He was doing something he shouldn't have been doing in the first place. And that, in effect, that's the analogy to the recession. The recession is the moment that the economy catches up with us. It says, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're on an unsustainable track here. The economy as a whole is trying to do more than we can physically do. And ultimately, the result is a crash. In the same way that the master builder realizes he cannot finish this house. He's got to start doing something different. So strictly speaking, the recession, hard as this may be to believe, is actually not where the damage is done. The damage is done when we get on this unsustainable trajectory in the first place. When, in the example, when the master builder begins building something that can't be built, that was the problem. The solution is when he stops doing that and retools and does something else in light of the real resources that do exist in the economy. So you'll notice the answer to Hayek's question, how come there are all these errors being committed at the same time? The answer is interest rates are being fiddled with. They're not being allowed to tell the truth. So investors are investing at the wrong time and in the wrong things. The interest rate, Hayek said, is supposed to be a break. It's supposed to be a break on our ambitions. It's supposed to tell us, stop. Don't do, the, do this, don't do that. But instead of red lights, what this constant pushing down of interest rates does is it gives, the, gives green lights constantly. Green light, green light, go, 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 invest, invest, invest. And that's precisely what we've had during the, the uh, housing boom. People are just being told, yeah, keep buying houses, keep buying, keep buying, keep buying. If there hadn't been, and now I will give away the sinister institution, uh, if there hadn't been a Federal Reserve System that was pumping in all this money and pushing these interest rates down artificially, then people would not have gone on this crazy house buying binge where people who are unemployed own five investment houses. Like, how could that be? And, and, and they actually think that if they just sit there, we buy the house and I just sit in it, I would get richer. Or if I pour $10,000 into it, I'll make $150,000. I mean, for a brief moment, that did kind of work. But this is, this is ultimately what the Fed, in effect, encourages us to do, is green light, keep on going. In fact, in 2001, we had a slight downturn. 
2001 is the first recession we've ever had, ever, in which housing starts went up. So it's a recession. People are building more houses. Now, what normally what would have happened if the Fed had not intervened at that point is that people would have said, okay, uh, maybe i got to do something else. i got to invest in something else. Interest rates would have, would have shot up. But Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve, decided that uh, we've got to push interest rates down. We're just going to push them down. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And in 2001, he pushed interest rates down 11 times. So people stayed in housing. Seemed like a good investment. There was, there was no market signal telling them to stop speculating in real estate. Every signal was saying, go, go, go. And so it's exactly like the master builder, except what Alan Greenspan, in effect, did was get the master builder of our example drunk. But basically, he's intoxicating the master builder, so he keeps doing unsustainable things because he's too drunk to notice that he's running low on supplies. I mean, in effect, that's what he's doing, is encouraging the economy to stay on an unsustainable trajectory all this time, so that when the bust finally comes, it's all the worse. Because all this time, we've been doing the wrong things, because we've been misled into doing it. Now, what does this have to do with the freaking Great Depression? Well, of course, the Great Depression we're talking about, uh, beginning with the stock market collapse in 1929. But the real pain of the Great Depression doesn't actually start until 1931. That's what the economist uh, Benjamin Anderson called the tragic year, 1931. I mean, we, we all, we've all heard the statistics about unemployment at 25%, and in some places, 50% uh, or higher. And I mean, there are, there are economists who've done really bizarre uh, figuring, you know, where if we lined up all the unemployed people, and, you know, they, they could go all the way to Saturn, I mean, some crazy thing. <laughs> So, I mean, like, I, I don't want to dehumanize unemployed people by using an example like that, but that's sort of it. So, I mean, we all know there was a terrible, terrible collapse uh, following, initially upon the stock market collapse, but really taking, taking shape after 1931. Well, during the 1920s, hardly anybody noticed that anything was wrong. It seemed like, you know, it's a go-go economy. Everything's boom. And indeed, I don't want to suggest that everything was wrong in the 20s. A lot of great things did happen. In, in the 20s, a tremendous increase in people's standard of living, in the output of the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy, by the end of the 20s, is producing about one-third of all the production in the entire world. The closest runner-up, it was a tie between Germany and Britain at 10% each. No one could even touch the U.S. So, I mean, you know, that is real stuff. That is real prosperity. So we don't want to disparage that. But there is, nevertheless, a problem. But as I say, it's a problem that the mainstream of the economics profession at that time, by and large, did not notice. Personified by a guy named Irving Fisher. Irving Fisher is considered to be perhaps the godfather of modern mainstream uh, neoclassical economics. And Fisher, in the 20s, said we have entered a new era of prosperity. Because now, we don't have to suffer through business cycles, because now we can scientifically plan the economy. We can plan the money supply. We can plan with interest rates. Don't worry about it. There isn't going to be another one of these. And then 1929 hit. Let me share with you a couple of interesting contracts. We'll put it that way. Here's what Irving Fisher said, September 5th, 1929. Now, stocks are about to, and the bottom's about to fall out about in about a month. September 5th, 1929, Irving Fisher, the godfather of modern economics. There may be a recession in stock prices, but not anything in the nature of a crash. Dividend returns on stocks are moving higher. This is not due to receding prices for stocks and will not be hastened by any anticipated crash, the possibility of which I fail to see. October 15th, he says, now, now we're like a, a week or so away, stocks have reached a permanently high plateau. Uh, and then he said that he expected to see the stock market a good deal higher than it is today within a few months. <coughs> he says, I do not feel that there will soon, if ever, be a 50 or 60 point break below present levels. Okay, a week later. The breaks of the last few days have driven stocks down to hard rock. I believe that we will have a ragged market for a few weeks and then the beginning of a mild bull movement that will gain momentum next year. October 28th, 29th, Dow Jones plummets 25%. Fisher says, stock prices are absurdly low. 
But in fact, they had a much steeper decline ahead of them. By the time the bottom was reached, stocks were off nearly 90% from their peak. Uh, Fisher lost uh, two fortunes in that, uh, his wife's fortune in his own. Uh, but so it didn't seem to know, okay, all right, well, you can make fun of Fisher, that's easy to do. And, and, and you know, again, I'm not trying to laugh at this guy. But the point is that mainstream economics today rests its claims on its ability to predict. That a theory is only as good as its ability to predict. And yet, who's predicting the crash the year before it happens? It's Mises, the great Austrian economist. Mises says, it is, he does not say permanent prosperity uh, is, is here, we're entering a new era, we, we, the stocks have reached a permanently high plateau, nothing like that. He says, it is clear that the crisis must come sooner or later. It is also clear that the crisis must always be caused primarily and directly by the change in the conduct of the banks. If we speak of error on the part of the banks, however, we must point to the wrong they do in encouraging the upswing. The fault lies not with the policy of raising the interest rate, but only with the fact that it was raised too late. The only way to do away with, or even to alleviate, the periodic return of the business cycle, with its denouement of the crisis, is to reject the fallacy that prosperity can be produced by using banking procedures to make credit cheap. Okay, that's 1928, and that's the sort of thing that's, getting, that's leading to a renaissance in uh, Misesian studies. This is precisely the advice that, that needs to be heard now. And indeed, when we look at the 1920s, what do we see? We see the Federal Reserve doing exactly what the Austrians warn against. Constant interference. We, we see an inflationary uh, interference in the economy around 1924, and then particularly 1927-28. Uh, in fact, the, the chairman of the New York Fed, who was the real mover at that time in the Federal Reserve, uh, Benjamin Strong, even told a fellow central banker that he was going to give a coup de whiskey to the stock market. Hmm, well, what does that mean? Well, I'm gonna pump a lot of money and credit into this system and that will yield us prosperity. But as we've seen with the Austrian business cycle theory, it's a false prosperity. It's a sugar hop. It's a temporary appearance of prosperity, but what it really is, is a disarrangement of the structure of production that eventually comes undone. Now, the reasons why uh, he inflated, and it's another whole other matter, um, and I've talked about that in other cases, and I'll talk about it at the end. But the point is, what do we see in the 20s? We see a very substantial inflation of the money supply uh, when the money supply is measured correctly. Um, and what do we see in the Depression? We see precisely, a very simply, we see exactly what the Austrians would predict. That where would we expect to see the biggest, the, the, the greatest amount of pain in the economy? Well, in those sectors of, of uh, long-term investment that were artificially stimulated, that were uneconomic and shouldn't have been started, that's where we should expect to see the most pain. That's precisely where we see the most pain. In construction and manufacturing and, and raw materials, the higher order stages, which are the ones that are artificially expanded by the Fed's uh, inflation, they're the ones that get hit the hardest. It's not the retail stores. Yeah, they got hit, but not nearly as bad as firms that are operating in the higher order stages. Those are the stages that are excessively stimulated by the Federal Reserve. So this is why it's not correct to say the cause of the Great Depression was that people were too poor to buy goods. And so therefore, all the retail stores had to close. That doesn't explain it at all. Because what's getting hurt in the Depression are things like uh, heavy, heavy machinery that people don't, individuals don't buy, only businesses buy. Things that individuals buy were not get as hard. So that cannot explain it. So the Austrian theory does, in fact, uh, help very much to explain the previously inexplicable. OK, now before I move on to even more fun things, one slightly dorkier thing, uh, which is, uh, as long as we're saying something about the Federal Reserve, is another myth. Now, a lot of these myths, you find that what I'm kind of driving at here, when I talk about the business cycle and what's really causing them, that you notice that this is not like some spontaneous phenomenon that occurs in the free market, right? This was an interference with the free market that's causing this. Uh, the sort of the, the, the thread that runs through all the examples I'm giving is that every one of these myths is based on the idea that unless we have some kind of group of commissars in charge of this or that, then everything's going to be chaotic 
And uh, well, the free market couldn't possibly solve it. If we were left to our own devices, heaven help us. We need our wise overlords to tell us what interest rates should be and, and play around with things. That's the sort of main theme that runs through this. Whereas I'm suggesting that, for example, in this first case, that business cycles are not caused by things just going on their own, but precisely by this type of interference. And then secondly, the Federal Reserve itself. Again, when you talk about this issue today, at least you can get a hearing. You couldn't have gotten a hearing about this five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, simply because the Federal Reserve is just one of those things you don't talk about. You just, you just know the experts are in charge. We peons aren't even entitled to an opinion about the Federal Reserve. Just shut your freaking mouth. Let them do their work. You don't even know what's going on, so just shut up. Now you can actually get a word in edgewise about the Fed, but what you're told is, well, man, gosh, without the Fed, think of the disasters that would struck. I mean, we would be back to the boom-bust cycles of the 19th century. We'd be back to all the economic instability we had before, whereas now we've had much more stability <coughs> thanks to the Fed. So what's the matter with you? What, do you want to go back to 1838 or something? Like, what's wrong with you? That's the typical sort of, sort of argument. Well, you know, we need Ben Bernanke. We need one guy to tell us, uh, as Alan Greenspan did, he actually said on numerous occasions, you know, I just had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that the federal funds rate needs to be a quarter point low. I'm not joking about this. I mean, and, and, and people are going, yeah, wow. Uh, in fact, there was even a case where the New Republic magazine, which is my least favorite magazine, New Republic magazine had a journalist named Stephen Glass, some of you guys might remember this guy, in the early 90s, Stephen Glass was breaking like all the most interesting stories. And other journalists were so envious of this guy. Where is he getting all these awesome stories? And other editors were saying, what's the matter with you, you bum? Why don't you break any of these stories? You know how Stephen Glass broke all his stories? He made them up. They were all fake. And so you could make up lots of great stories when you know, you're just making them up. And one of the stories he made up was that investors on Wall Street had built a little shrine in Alan Greenspan with flowers and candles. And they would all get there and meditate in front of it together. And the scary thing about this is that nobody noticed that was a phony story. People just said, well, well that seems something, like something like somebody might do. <laughs> and trying to, the guy running, I mean, this is something like out, something out of problem. And, you know, we need this one guy to tell us uh, where everything should be. So, uh, so I do want to say a little something about this. Um, basically, the, the way they arrive at this claim that we've had a lot more stability since the Fed to uh, the data that was, that, that's been used by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and more recently, economists have looked at that data and said, um, to, 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 to quote uh, uh, economist George Selgin, you would, you would have better luck and get more accurate results in describing the conditions of the economy uh, using uh, sheep entrails than using these numbers from the NBER. But it turns out these numbers are, are flawed for about 18,000 reasons. In, in every way, they insert biases that overstate economic instability before the Fed and understate economic instability after. And secondly, what we, and I might, in, in, in rollback, I should get a good one this, the uh, footnotes and everything for this, we'll note that Christina Romer, who for a long time, uh, was chief was chief economist even for uh, the current president. So she's not inclined to be a, a, you know anti-Fed or pro-free market banking or anything like that. But she is one of the pioneers in this to at first identify that wait a minute these numbers are, are, are bogus. They're just they're not worth anything. And they they totally overstate and understate in all the wrong places. And they give us a, a misleading impression. But secondly, a lot of the economic instability that we see before the Fed is caused not by the monetary system that existed at that time, but caused by the fact that this is largely an agricultural society. So if you have harvest failures, well, that translates in economic statistics into huge swings. So huge swings in output. One year we're producing this much, the next year we're producing down here. And so you look at the data and you say, what a wild economy this was without the Fed. No, it's a wild economy because it's agricultural and you have a lot of harvest failures. But that when you look at the instability we've had since the Fed, that is much more readily attributable to the monetary system itself. Uh, we find, when we look at revised statistics, corrected for the errors of the NBER, that recessions were in fact not more frequent in the pre-Fed period than in the post-Fed period, if we include the Great Depression. Remember, the Great Depression occurred after the Fed was created. The Fed was created to prevent something like the Great 
Great Depression. And then 16 years later, we get the Great Depression. Now, again, quoting George Selgin, we will be sports about this. We will not count the Fed, uh, the Great Depression against the Fed, because we all know that was just practice. So we'll leave the Great Depression out. We will be good sports about it. So let's just look at post-World War II and compare that to the pre-Fed period. Well, in that case, we do find economic contractions to be slightly more frequent in the period before the Fed, but they were also almost three months shorter on average and no more severe. Recoveries were also faster in the pre-Fed period. Uh, and if we extend our pre-Fed period to going from like 1870, let's say, if we go all the way back to 1796, we find no appreciable difference at all between the length and duration of recessions as compared to the period of the Fed. Okay, but perhaps the, the Fed has made the economy more stable in terms of output, you know, up, up, up. But again, uh, we, we, uh, we've seen that the instability that existed in the 19th century is largely, uh, has largely nothing to do with the, uh, with the monetary system itself. Uh, but just look at a couple of illustrative examples in the 19th century, because this is what you get thrown at you. In the 19th century, we had a lot of bank panics and booms and busts, and that's why we needed a Fed. Well, none of these panics was as bad as the Great Depression, for one thing. But if we look at something like the Panic of 1819, what's going on there? Well, after years of the banks, and especially the, the uh, bank, Second Bank of the United States, which is a national bank chartered by the U.S. government, they're all creating all this money, and again, this has the usual effects. It pushes interest rates down, stimulates crazy uh, speculation binges, everybody's speculating in real estate once again. It sounds like 2008, really, or, or 2005, let's say. And then finally, the economy catches up with this, the sugar high wears off, and we wind up with the crash. Well, it's interesting to note that after that crash occurred, we got the panic of 1819, countless people who had believed in inflation and the banks need to create a lot of new money, that's good for the economy, they looked at the panic of 1819 and they said, oh my God, no, actually what it does is the prosperity it creates is all fake. It's all just based on pieces of paper. That's not real wealth. That's not, that's not going to make us prosperous. So you get one, even politicians changed their mind on this. Uh, and other politicians were reaffirmed in their views that yes, this is a scourge on our society. We need hard money based on precious metals. That was Jefferson's view. And after the panic of 1819, he worked all the harder to bring about precisely that type of monetary system. The Panic of 1873, for a long time we were told, the Panic of 1873 yielded us the so-called Long Depression, which supposedly went from 1873 to 1879. You don't want another Long Depression, do you? That's why we have the, the, uh, the Feds, to prevent there being another Long Depression. Well, this one doesn't work either, because it turns out that now economic historians, again, looking at it in light of fresh data, now say, believe it or not, there was no Long Depression. This is the consensus of economic historians. There was no, so the very thing that we hear constantly used and referred to as a justification for why we need the Fed, there ain't no such thing. Let me cite for you my favorite source in the world, the New York Times. I love citing the New York Times. Actually, this is the only time in the history of my entire life that I've cited the New York Times, because I feel like I'm still sad for them. They had a totally unbroken streak of being wrong that was going perfect, and then they, then they wrote this. The New York Times, which admits nothing, admits this. Recent detailed reconstructions of 19th century data by economic historians show that there was no 1870s depression. Aside from a short recession in 1873, in fact, the decade saw possibly the fastest sustained growth in American history. Employment grew strongly, faster than the rate of immigration. Consumption of food and other goods rose across the board. On a per capita basis, almost all output measures were up spectacularly. By the end of the decade, people were better housed, better clothed, and lived on bigger farms. Department stores were popping up, even in medium-sized cities. America was transforming into the world's first mass consumer society. And finally, if we're going to claim that, well, before we had the Fed, we had all these bank panics, and now things are much better, there are a couple things to bear in mind even here. Canada didn't have any of these bank panics that we saw in the 19th century. How come Canada didn't have them we did? That's, that's the question. Canada's got an economy that's not dissimilar to the U.S., and yet, for some reason, Canada doesn't suffer through these panics. These types of bank panics that we had in the 19th century from the Civil War, uh, the end of the Civil War, up to the eve of the Fed, were just a curiosity in the rest of the world, which hardly saw them. 
So the question becomes, well, how come they're happening in the U.S.? What's going on in the U.S. that's making it more prone to bank panics? It can't be the lack of a central bank, because there were hardly, there were no central banks in the world really at that time, or, or you know, very few. So how could that be the So what's really going on? The answer is that many American states had, and it's in these states where we see the greatest instability. They had unit banking laws, which said uh, you have a bank, you can't have more than one office. You have one office, you can't have another one down the street, or heaven forbid, another one somewhere else in the country. You have one office. So that means, all right, you got one office, you know, it's like 1850. You don't have a lot of ways to, to, to move around very easily. So you're probably going to lend to people in like this three by three area. But well, what if something bad happens in that area? It brings the whole bank down. Because you can't diversify, because you, you, you've got one office. So you become extremely fragile and undiversified. And so what a surprise, we wind up with these bank panics. Whereas, as I say, Canada didn't have bank panics. It also didn't have these unit banking laws. It didn't have these regulations. And so they had a much sounder banking system, so that when the Great Depression came and 9,000 US banks failed, zero Canadian banks failed. Zero. It's not because they had a central bank. They didn't get the Bank of Canada until 1934. And yet somehow they managed to avoid uh, these, these terrible outcomes. And then finally, even during these pre-Fed panics, the bank failure rate was small, as were the losses that depositors suffered. The worst one was the Panic of 1893. And even there, depositor losses amounted to 0.1% of GDP at that time. Whereas just in the past 30 years, just since about uh, 1980, the past 30 years, where now that we have central banks all over the world that supposedly solve all these problems, we've seen 20 banking crises that have led to depositor losses in excess of 10% of GDP, and half of them seeing losses in excess of 20%, and, and so on and on and on. Now, finally, I guess what I want to uh, kind of finish with, not, not, not that I want to make you depressed, I, I really want to lift you up, really. I want you to walk out of here walking on air. In fact, in fact, you know what, that's true, that would be irresponsible, man. I don't want people to walk out of here depressed. You came here in the miserable cold, you need to have some happy news. The happy news is, is, is this, and then we get to the bad news. And then in the questions, we can figure out how the heck to get out of the bad news. The happy news is that another one of the myths that uh, has, in effect, justified and led to public acquiescence in expansion of government is the sort of inchoate sense that if there weren't government intervention of various unspecified kinds, again, we'd all be uh, earning three cents an hour, and you know, f uh, feudal barons would be dominating the economy, or, you know, and they'd, they'd be like these short little guys with white mustaches walking around with sacks of money with dollar signs on them, running the economy. And this, I, remember, I remember being in junior high, and I remember that was the impression that I was given, and I thought, my gosh, how could somebody be such a stooge of industry to support the free market? Okay, now having said that, I want to put this aside for a minute and point out something that's gone totally unnoticed, or not totally, but largely unnoticed. You'd think it would be all over the news and in the headlines, and yet we haven't seen it. And that is the dramatic improvement that has been made in the conquest of poverty in the world over the past 50 to 60 years. Uh, it's been so dramatic that, again, you'd think people would be jumping for joy at the news. But in fact, nobody knows about the news. You can't jump for joy about something you don't know about. So, for example, in 1820, 85% of the world estimated was living in what economists call absolute poverty. By 1950, that was at 50%. By 1980, that was down to about 33%. And by 2001, it was down to 18%. So from uh, the early 1980s to the early 2000s, to that roughly two-decade period, we saw not only the percentage, but the absolute number of people in poverty in the world fall. This has never happened before in history. We have seen life expectancy increase dramatically in the developing countries as compared to the richer ones. We've seen caloric intake in the third world go up by one third. We've seen, for example, in England, in the late 19th century, a rich Englishman and a poor Englishman were separated by 17 years of life expectancy and five inches in height, such as the difference in nutrition. Whereas now, it is, the difference is down to two years and less than one inch today. 
Well, I mean, this is something to cheers. It's absolutely fantastic. In the United States, the poverty rate, which is a, a higher material standard of comfort than the absolute poverty figure I was mentioning before, the poverty rate fell from about, uh, again, by today's standards, fell from about 95, literally 95% of the population at the beginning of the 20th century to about 12 to 14% at the end. The bottom quintile of the population saw its real incomes rise by almost 2,000% which is a much greater jump than occurred in any of the higher quintiles. The average household below the poverty line around the year 2000 would have ranked among the richest 5 to 10 percent of households in real incomes in 1900. Uh, we all of us, no matter what our income level, have found ourselves able, now regardless of the difficulties we're going through now, and I suggest that that's, uh, that's due in large part to the, the assistance of our overlords, uh, we find ourselves able to acquire things that no one could have dreamed of years ago. I mean, you know, I have this stinking phone. You know, I can like talk to some guy in Lebanon or something. I can like have a seminar with this guy. I'm stinking phone. And, and, we're, and we're still complaining about how crummy our lives are. Well, you know, not that this is going to give your life meaning, but for goodness sake, I mean, you know, as one of my friends puts it, on the Jetsons, you know, they had a little mechanism where they could, you could be filmed and somebody else somewhere could, could see your image, but you, there was a special chair you had to sit in, you had to sit there and be like this. Whereas now you can walk around on a phone. The Jetsons couldn't even imagine. The freaking Jetsons, a space age show, couldn't have even dreamed. They, they were just dreaming the stuff up and they dreamed up something lamer than what we all walk around with now. Okay, so now how did this happen? How the heck did this happen? Now, the, the narrative that I gave you at the beginning of, you know, well, if it, if it weren't for the government, you know, we would be totally taken advantage of, blah, blah, blah. well, we were kind of inclined to think well, there must have been some government thing that made this all possible. But then what is it? Is it the minimum wage law? Hardly anyone in the U.S. works for the minimum wage. I mean, relatively speaking, percentage-wise, relatively few people work for the minimum wage. So if it were true that we're all just going to make, uh, inevitably make two cents a day, we would all, everybody would be making minimum wage. They don't. So what exactly is going on here? And basically the answer runs as follows. Because what I want to suggest is that the fact that we've seen this tremendous decrease in poverty around the world is not just a coincidence. Like, isn't that funny? You know, the 20th century came around and poverty went around. Maybe the number 20 has some magic. No, no, no. I want to suggest there's a connection. And the connection basically runs like this. Let us imagine, this is my thought experiment that I use a lot, but let me imagine that you have an economy where uh, Space aliens come to Earth, and they take away all the machines that we use to produce them. So all the assembly line stuff, all the trucks, all the machines, uh, you know, like all the steam shovels we used to use, we have to use regular shovels, all the computers we used to use, uh, we don't even have typewriters, you have to write everything out, uh, there are no phones, whatever, you don't even have a stick and telegraph, all you have is like a, you know, like a bullhorn or something, that's it. So, Imagine that economy. Let's imagine that suddenly you woke up and that's the economy you are living in. You would immediately understand why your standard of living was about to plummet. You would understand why. It's not because people are wickedly depriving you of, of things. It's because that economy can't produce enough things, right? I mean, with our bare hands, how are you going to produce a plasma TV with your bare hands from beginning to end? There's no way to do it. I mean, how are you going to produce, how are you going to do, do much mining with just your bare hands? Just get on down there and start scratching. Like, well, how would you even start? Like, you couldn't do any of this stuff. So immediately we see that in that economy, the reason that the money we earn from working doesn't stretch very far, doesn't buy as many goods, is that the economy is not physically capable of producing very many goods. That's, that's the problem. So what if we all said, OK, I know we're living in this primitive economy with no machines. I'm going to continue to work just 40 hours a week. I'm just going to work 40 hours a week, and somehow everything will work out. Well, again, you would, because the economy used to, let's say the economy used to be able to produce, we'll do this very scientifically, used to be able to produce this much stuff. And now, under these more primitive conditions, to produce this much. And in the this much, there are whole classes of goods that can't be produced at all. No one's getting a car. No one's going to get a car under these conditions. You can produce this much. For each one of us, obviously, we're all going to, on average, get a much tinier slice of stuff. That's the point. We would all see that. So we would all, if we want to survive at any level that we would consider human, we would have to work our butts off constantly. Like, we would be having to work like 120 hours a week, and even then, barely be able to produce enough stuff so that each of us could proportionally get some 
tolerable amount. So again, in that case, it wouldn't be that some evil uh, titan of industry is forcing me to work 120 hours a week. I mean, you understand that in that case, it would be that if people aren't working that many hours a week, there's not enough stuff produced to support them. I mean, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the situation, that's the nature of the case. So then how do we get this imaginary economy out of its poverty? We try to reverse the alien process. We, we try to create more machines. We try to, we, we save our money. That savings is invested by entrepreneurs. They buy the means of production. They buy machinery. They invest in factories. They set up assembly lines. And then we can produce, we can be more physically productive. We can produce more stuff. And that means on average more stuff per person. And the, the competition between firms is going to bring the prices down. Because all of a sudden, if I have a steam shovel and, and, and machinery and capital goods, I can produce like 100 times as much stuff per person as, as we used to. So there's a huge, huge amount of stuff that now in the economy. And that an increased amount is going to put downward pressure on their real prices, adjusted for inflation, their real prices. So that the, whatever the dollar amount I earn, it will stretch farther. There's, there's more stuff in the economy, more physical stuff being produced. Population is roughly stable, so there is more for us each to have, and the, and the purchasing power of our money increases, and the prices come down. That's basically what's been going on. That's the driving force. As we've seen, the liberalization of economies around the world it hasn't moved as fast as it might, be, but that's the process. So you see that we don't want to tax this process. This is the process by which our economy becomes more physically productive, and thereby increases our uh, uh, the purchasing power of our money because there's more stuff, so our dollar stretches uh, farther. This is uh, not something we want to tax, something we want to encourage. Because it's the only way we can make everyone better off. Yeah, that's true. I could just rob some guy and, and give the proceeds to you. But that doesn't make everyone better off. And plus, this guy isn't a sucker. He's just going to run away for a while. And he's not going to let me keep doing this. So that might work for like five seconds. And moreover, in, in a really poor economy, like in you know, early Industrial Revolution England, there aren't nearly enough rich people to take the stuff from. You know, it, it, like one in a thousand people would be rich. So if I take this guy's stuff and I divide it by 999 and I hand it out to people, I mean, maybe this guy is eating twice as much as everybody else. So I take his excess of food and I divide it by 999. No one's going to notice the difference. Oh, wow, I got one twelfth of a chicken leg. Wow, my standard of living has improved. <laughs> Or he's got, let's say, 20 times as much furniture as the average person. I divide that by 999. Nobody's going to notice. Okay, now I got one twelfth of a table left. It's even better. I and mean, no one's even going to notice. So we have to increase the overall amount. There ain't no shortcut to doing that other than by private investment in capital goods unless you produce more stuff. So you see, we can, in fact, bring about prosperity. If this, this does indeed happen. We are, we are living proof of it. We can, in fact, do this. But now, finally, having said that, my final myth is the sort of bad news. This is the bad news that we're living through today, but we're not hearing much about. And this whole crisis coming, but we'll just grow our way out of it. And, and you think I'm making that up, there are people who say that. Let me spell out to you the case that we're facing, because everybody needs to know this. Because we're not going to be able to solve it unless we understand the depth of the, wow, I almost said a bad word. Of the stuff that we're in, I mean, it's really it's up pretty high. Okay, we have to know what the problem is. Okay, so people talk a lot about the national debt is fourteen trillion dollars. Okay, big whoop because compared to that, we have a much bigger problem, and that is there are estimates being done now of how much the various promises the federal government has made to people, namely in the form of partly social security, but that's almost a trivial issue. Uh, mainly in, in medical assistance like Medicare, uh, the problem is that those programs, as I think most of us at least realize, they're, they're underfunded. That if you capitalize out to the indefinite future how much they're underfunded, um, it's, it's a pretty, pretty awful figure. It's, uh, it's $111 trillion that they're, they're short. So that's going to be a little tricky to tax at that level. To, to, to find, uh, to, to come up with that money. $111 trillion. Now these figures are coming from, uh, this is, you know, isn't just some kook 
thing that I'm just digging up. I mean, I'm trying to dig them up from the most mainstream sources so that I won't be accused of, of gaming with the numbers. Uh, so you can actually find the heads of, I mean, because I've just heard about it, the heads of various regional Federal Reserve banks using figures like this. So you see, I'm even, I'm even being a super sport and taking them at face value. Well, this is, uh, this is higher than the total net worth of the entire U.S. economy. So that's what we mean when we say the country is bankrupt. Okay, there ain't, there ain't no way out. So, all right, so, so it's true we have a deficit problem, that's true. But the deficits don't even, come, don't even deal with this, because these are off-budget things. So the deficits don't even include this problem. And yet even the deficits alone, and let's assume interest rates stay where they are, super low, even if they stay there until 2020. By 2020, just the interest on the national debt will be a trillion, almost a trillion dollars. So I mean, this, so that's just that's just a tiny problem compared to this other thing, but that's still a big problem. The wheels are coming off here. The wheels are coming off, and the myth is that we've been taught for the longest time that you know everything somehow will work out. The experts are running things, and somehow, no matter how staggering the problem seems, it'll all work itself out. Next year will always be roughly the same as this year, give or take three percent. Like, you know, we'll always find more taxpayers, we'll always figure something out. That's not going to be the case. It, this, it's not going to be the case. Let me quote you Lawrence Kotlikoff from Boston University. He's a Democrat. He belongs to the Democratic Party. He's part of the establishment all the way. He says that the fiscal gap is actually $200 trillion. I don't know where he gets that figure. That's about twice what I've ever seen. Uh, and then he, 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 he keeps saying that there are some relatively painless reforms that uh, can solve this problem. However, to my knowledge, he has never shared them with us. What pain? If there was a painless reform, they would have done it a long time ago. There is no such thing. But yet, here he is. Again, this is not some crazy Tom Woods, uh, you know, extremist, loon, uh, free market fundamentalist. This is a Boston University economist, Democrat, whatever. He says this, we have 78 million baby boomers who, when fully retired, will collect benefits from Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid that, on average, exceed per capita GDP. The annual cost of these entitlements will total about $4 trillion in today's dollars. Yes, our economy will be bigger in 20 years, but not big enough to handle this size load year after year. This is what happens when you run a massive Ponzi scheme for six decades straight, taking ever larger resources from the young and giving them to the old while promising the young their eventual turn at passing the generational buck. Wow. I mean, you were, you were written out of polite society for saying things like this even five years ago. And now this guy says, how's this all going to come to an end? And he says, in a very nasty manner. The first possibility is massive benefit cuts visited on the baby boomers in retirement. The second is astronomical tax increases that leave the young with little incentive to work and save. And the third is the government simply printing vast quantities of money to cover its bills. Well, probably we're going to see all three of these things. And, uh, and one could go on quoting people. There's no, there's no real need to. One of the reasons for this looming collapse is the aging of the population. This is going on all over the developed world. Uh, it's partly because we had this unusually large baby boom generation. Uh, we've had falling fertility rates, and we've had great medical advances. So I, I don't really suggest that, well, boy, it really stinks that we're all living longer, and I'm glad we're living longer. But the, promise, the problem is that these impossible entitlement promises were built on the assumption that ever more people would be born like at a much faster rate than they're being born, or that there'd be totally unrealistic increases in, in productivity. But if current birth rates in the U.S. continue the way they are, by 2040, the number of people aged 80 and over will outnumber children under age 5. That has never happened before. And the figures just get, I mean, if, if, if you look at the uh, number of people aged 100 and over will increase by 13 times. Now, again, it's not that I, I, I'm not ageist, I'm not discriminating against people who are uh, 100 and older. I'm just simply saying that their health care costs are much, much higher. And we have to figure out where are the funds for this going to come from. Well, in particular now, I, I, I might point out that if people were to argue that don't worry, we, we've got cost control measures that are going to take care of this, that the new Obama medical bill is going to control costs, and that's going to solve this problem. There are sort of two answers to that. Number one, one of the authors of that, David Bowen, one of the authors of the bill, 
uh, now that he's out of government, is, is admitting that, well, this, this is a coverage bill. It's not a cost control bill. We'll, we'll get to the cost control later. Yeah, they always do. They always do. And, and by the way, anytime you hear any political party say, we want to cut X trillion dollars over 10 years, it's the same old thing. Sure, we'll cut it over 10 years. We'll put all the cuts in year number nine. And that's what they always do. But the problem with this answer is that even if the Obama program had this effect, the problem is that we're still, the Medicare, the, the figures that I just talked to you about, about the problem with Medicare and how expensive it's going to be, these already assume massive cost cuts occur. They've already factored into these numbers that substantial cost cuts will occur. They have not explained to us where the cost cuts come from. They've already been factored in. So it's not like, well, if cost cuts come, we'll, we'll solve this problem. No, if cost cuts come, we'll still be at exactly this point. That's where we are. And now, given that the rest of the world is also aging, China's having a, going to have a big problem uh, with its one-child policy. It's going to have a demographic crisis. Uh, China's going to have to deal with that problem. Japan has to deal with that problem. It, it, has, it, it has the biggest aging problem in the world. And China and Japan are helping to fund this borrowing gravy train that's going on in the US. Well, eventually, they're going to have to turn their resources inward. And they're, they're going to say to themselves, gee, you know, buying uh, you know, uh, treasuries that are yielding us 0% from the U.S. may not be the best use for our money as we're going through this demographic crisis. So this is what we are facing right now. And if we think we can tax our way out of it, we should bear in mind two things. Number one, the typical middle class family has seen its tax burden increase over the past generation by about 140% because of uh, the fall in the real value of the standard exemption and the rise in uh, payroll, property, and state income and sales taxes. So there's that problem. Secondly, what we've seen over the, uh, the course of the last 50 to 60 years is that no matter what you do to tax rates, the amount of revenue the federal government takes in hovers around 20% of GDP. That's an astonishing figure. That, that means that really you, you, there's only so much you can do tinkering with taxes. You're still going to get not a very substantial difference in how much you can bring in. So it's not clear that it can be solved that way, even if this weren't morally objectionable. And then finally, what you guys all know, uh, in May 2010, a poll found that 85% of college seniors are planning to move in with their parents after graduating. They've got to move back in with their parents. And then they have to cope with the, on average, $23,000 in debt that they're getting their productive lives with. And they've made it so that, by the way, although you can forgive the debts of very influential people in our society, you can't forgive student loan debt. That does not get canceled in personal bankruptcy. It stays with you forever. Oh, great. Ain't that super? Boy, they've really, they've really prepared for you guys. They've really treated you guys just super great. And I won't even talk about what's going on at the state level. I mean, we've got state pension programs going bust, uh, dozens of them by two, uh, 2025. Uh, we've got states going bankrupt, it looks like. We've got Detroit. I mean, my gosh, what happened to the city of Detroit? It's my last point, the city of Detroit. What happened to this city? It's unbelievable. Half the population has left Detroit. We've had a situation where housing prices, and median housing price in 2003 in Detroit was $98,000. <clears> By 2009, it was down to 13600 You think, oh my gosh, it really hit rock bottom, didn't it? No, one year ago it was at 7,000. I mean, the, uh, a quarter of the schools are being shut down. The, the, the money is gone. Uh, this was the model of, well, you know, you, you just keep, again, the, you never run out of resources. You just keep on taxing. You always come up with new things. It'll, nothing will ever go wrong. Now, this has been reported a little bit, but nothing like this has ever happened in the history of any American city. Nothing like this. A, a collapse on this scale. So given the, the extent of this scale, it has gotten, by that proportion, basically no attention. So, all right. So let's, let's recap here. What, what, have we, what have we realized here? Well, what I'm trying to suggest are basically two things. That, uh, number one, a free people can indeed bring about prosperity without the intervention of whatever it is, central banks or, uh, you know, what, whatever it is, uh, uh, controls on, on business and all the rest of it that all these things have indeed occurred just with free people interacting with each other. That we do not, in fact, we will prosper without the intervention of, uh, of our wise old ones. We, we've seen that. And that the situation that we are in now, where governments have just made impossible promises, they are not innocent 
here. It's not just, oh, well, you know, they had our interest at heart, but, you know, they just made some mistakes. Uh, I don't see how that's how you could describe this situation. They had to know that this was coming, but they all figured, I will be retired by then, and some other sucker will have to take the blame for it, and somebody else will have to endure the pain. Unfortunately, that is going to be us. It seems to me that we are about, uh, precisely because we have bought into this view that on our own, or that in the absence of, of government, there are no other ways to regulate our lives. We have bought into this thing, we have allowed it to get to this point, and now what's going to happen is when the thing collapses, or when it starts handing out checks to people, but the checks don't buy anything, we're going to realize that ultimately there is no magic power that's going to come rescue us. There is no magic force called government that's going to come up with resources out of thin air to make everything right. What we're going to find out is it's just you and me. That's what we're going to find out. We're going to find out that we've been living in a fantasy world. The, the fantasy world that Frederick Bastiat pointed out in the 19th century when he said the state is the great fiction by which everyone attempts to live at the expense of everyone else. Everybody loots everybody else. The industrialists take, the various types of business take, the farmers take, the students take, the social workers take, everybody takes. And we all think that this is the only way to live. But maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a way where we put the guns down, we treat each other humanely, and we care for each other. Because what I've been talking about today is mostly history. But now we're thinking about the future, the history that's yet to be written. This history is going to define what kind of people we are. When this crisis strikes, what are we going to do? Are we going to just be a helpless blob? Or are we going to seek out the people who are going to be hurt? Are we going to identify within ourselves what our talents are? and put them at the service of people who are going to be hurt? Are we going to help in our own neighborhoods and get to know our own neighbors and solve this problem ourselves when we realize there is no Superman coming? Are we going to rise to the occasion when the promises are broken? That's what time will have to tell. So thank you very much.